reliving his school days very briefly now, but mostly preferring what happened afterwards. Eric Idle. Walkie talkie. And what is the difference between acting in real life, Muriel? Well, actors get treated pretty well. I mean, you've obviously been treated far too well in your time. It's made you uppity. Uppity? Yes. I'm not uppity. <laughs> I'm very easy to work with. I take direction, as you've noticed. Cut. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Why Stratford? Well, you know perfectly well why Stratford, Muriel, <laughs> because you buggers wouldn't afford the price of coming to France. Uh, I, so part of my life grew up in, uh, in Warwickshire. Uh, my mother lives in Stratford, so I come here a lot, and I take this walk, um, you know, in order to get out of the house. <laughs> do you? <laughs> no. uh, yeah, I do. I come and see this wonderful obelisk, dedicated as it is, to Mark Phillips. <laughs> And in fact, if rumour has uh, got anything to go by, bears a remarkable resemblance to Mark Phillips. <laughs> Which particular part of Mark well, Phillips? I wasn't going to go into that, Muriel. <laughs> uh, so, is this where you grew up then, scuttling amongst the grass and the, the mighty oaks here, well, getting I lived up to wicked things? I lived in Warwickshire from the age of about seven onwards, and uh, at school in Wolverhampton, so this was the nicer part of life. <laughs> Why, what was difficult about being in Wolverhampton? Have you ever been to Wolverhampton? I haven't, no. No. I'd keep it like that if I was you. <laughs> really, that bad? Um, well, I don't want to offend everybody in the Midlands, <laughs> except the people in Wolverhampton. Did you hate it? Um, it's not the most beautiful area of the world. Uh, but then, I mean, surely kids can have a good time anywhere they are if things are going all right. Yes, in boarding school for 12 years. And what's bad about boarding school? Some people really enjoy that. There's lots of spankings going on and midnight feasts. Yeah, well, yes. It's not so much spankings as beatings. Really? Which is... <laughs> it's not quite so much fun, I fancy. Were you beat? Oh, yes. Or beat in? Oh, yes. Yeah, so we were beaten a lot and the boys would beat you. What? Boys older boys? Oh, yeah. Really? Yes. And the, incent you know, the incentive is so that you go grow up to be older boys and then you're allowed to beat the younger ones. Is that not the sort of thing that turns you into a, a wild sexual pervert? It turned me into a wild sexual pervert, for Did sure. It? Yes, absolutely. I can't wait to whack little boys on the bottom. <laughs> the more, the merrier. So was it, was it straight on to university then, to Cambridge? Yeah. Was well, it you, wonderful? Oh, absolutely yeah. idyllic. Oh, yes. You could enjoy yourself every day. Yeah? Instead of just sneaking over the wall looking for girls, you know. So was it, I mean, when you were there, I mean, that was just, what, the 60s? Um, was it still brides heady? Was it still kind of um, lots of fey young men drinking champagne and driving about in mum and dad's car? It had that element about it and it sort of changed because when I was there, the Beatles happened and it sort of became kind of, uh, it switched very much from the sort of tweed jacketed people with leather patches on their coats, which was the more common student image with their gowns, into, I remember, Johnny Lynn and I, we went out and bought leather jackets, which was considered kind of a, a bit of daring. You're you know? radical, <laughs> Yes, you? very radical. And, um, you know, when we were, we were in the footlights, we were kind of very badly behaved and uh, slightly more punky. What, do, what does Should badly be? behave? What did that, that entail? Well, I think the previous footlights had, had all been very, um, you know, public school and very, you know, know how to go out to dinner and all that. And, and you stayed in people's country houses on tour. And our lot were kind of, uh, you know, wearing leather jackets and were proclaiming left of centre views. And, was, um, was you know, because... we also introduced, I introduced women. We allowed women into the footlights. Really? And were not president. allowed to They were not allowed to be members, which is very, very silly. Well, how peculiar. Yes, it was very peculiar. And also, you couldn't get, people didn't then have the experience to be funny, you know, if you don't allow them in. So a lot of, there was a lot of crying by gay, gay dons and <laughs> weeping and... The place won't be the same anymore, oh dear boy. Well, 
if you were the first to introduce women into the Cambridge Footlights, how come there were no women in the Monty Python team? It was, a bit, it was all male, very, very boys' own club. I suppose experience, really, you know? <laughs> the, the, first one, the first woman to be introduced into the Footlights on this particular event was actually Germaine Greer. Oh, not exactly the funniest woman in the world. She was very funny. Was she, she? Yeah, she auditioned for us and she, did, she came on dressed as a nun and then proceeded to do a strip <laughs> to the stripper, put on some flippers and a bathing costume and went off again, which was very funny. <laughs> she was very funny. We went on tour with her. She was in this review. That's strange. One doesn't tend to think of Dr. Greer as a stand-up comedian, she was, really. She used to do a review at Sydney and uh, hmm. Clive James was the other one. Not, not a woman, of course. So far as we know, anyway. <laughs> Do you think the women can be as funny as men? It's a terrible old chestnut, but it's like you were saying earlier, if you're not given the chance to do it, perhaps you never learn the skills. I think they're not possibly as hard laugh funny. I think they're as clever, and if they're doing acting, then they're certainly as good, and possibly even better, actually, because in, in acting comedy, I think they're fine. It's when you get down to stand-up or just doing hard laugh comedy, I don't think they are. Well, what's missing? Penis. <laughs> a penis? Oh, what a funny, funny thing that is. <laughs> no, but if you have the jesters always, traditionally, you used to hold that, didn't they? I mean, that's what they flap the audience with, and it's like an aggression thing that is used to sort of uh, uh, cow people into submission. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think that, that m m many women don't seem to have that... Uh, you know, that ruthlessness, the sense of power to dominate and to really get hold of an audience and to force them into laughing like I think some that males do. We're obviously going to have to learn to be powerful without a penis. <laughs> <laughs> Tricky thing, that, eh? <laughs> Can you buy strap-on ones but, from Boots the Chemist, maybe? But that's only in one area of comedy. I mean, I love to watch stand-up comedy for a bit, mm. but ultimately it's some, just a man just saying jokes and, you know, it isn't that interesting. I think uh, when you see it in in, in 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 a situation or in a you know in a film or something, I think that's funnier somehow, more more, more satisfactory anyway. Well, there seems to be a lack of bravery in you know spe especially televisual comedy lately. It's very safe compared to Monty Python. Nobody's stretched the boundaries of comedy as far as you did, you know, back in the 60s and 70s. Well, I just think we were very lucky. I mean, the time we came in to television, we got to play with all the toys. The BBC were wide open. We came in and we were working almost before they noticed we were in there. I mean, Monty Python's a mix of uh, Do Not Adjust Your Set and at last it's the 1948 show. And it, it blends those two together and adds Gilliam and becomes this strange thing. But most importantly, we could do what we wanted to do. And that's, you know, that's got harder, I think. What was the thing that you had most in common? Do you find that there was any one common binding factor of your personalities? I think it's a shared sense of humour. We all laughed. There was always something that made us all laugh. We always agreed on what was the funniest. We'd disagree on what wasn't quite so funny or the, the lower stages, but we actually totally were in agreement about what was funny, pretty much, at the, at the highest level of what was the funniest. And it was pretty unusual things at the time that you were laughing at. They hadn't been seen previously on British television, certainly. And it's interesting how they haven't dated at all. But that's because we were lucky enough. We came after the satire boom, and what we didn't want to do was satire. So we, we were dealing with comedy, which was, you know, maybe about things, but it wasn't about contemporary things, so it doesn't date. I mean, the parrot's still dead, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and God knows we've seen it quite a lot recently. But, and will again, I suspect. <laughs> Just being modest, you're supposed to say we were fantastic and, we and were knowing it. Oh, yeah. Fantastic oh. and great. And you... <laughs> I'm going to leap over this. Oh, my God. Like, I know. They do this a lot in this series. Oh! Hey, watch. <laughs> The um, Cambridge Footlights, I don't know if you've seen it recently, I mean, the, the, the kids, because I suppose that's what they are that come to do the Cambridge Footlights now in the Edinburgh Festival, seem to me just to be using it as some kind of a, a polite finishing school to shove on the, the CV before they go into the city or whatever it is they do. I'm not terribly sure how serious they are about it. Well, I don't think they're serious at all about it, but I think the thing about the Footlights is it, it is one of the few areas where you get practical experience of working comedy doing it, practicing it, and doing it in front of an audience. I mean, I was one of those kids in 1963, mm. and Mike and Terry were at the Oxford 
doing the Oxford Review. I think that's where everybody starts. I mean, do you think, for instance, that, that you would have had the skills that you have now had you not gone to Cambridge? Do you think we could have developed those... Would I have been a better comic if yes. I'd not gone to Cambridge? There's one of you no, who I left school and, you know, gone to work in a garage. I would be a garage mechanic. <laughs> really? Yes. Honestly, so your, your humour wouldn't have emerged... Well, I wouldn't you... have had the opportunity to spend uh, three years finding that this is something that interested me and then going for it and then going into doing cabarets at the weekends. Uh, but, I mean, you know, that's just one example of what you can do at a university. There's a, I mean, the educational opportunities for young people are just shrinking day by day under this particular government. It's soon well, going to be a case of you only get there if your parents can afford to, to put you there. Because previously, I mean, your mother didn't have to be rich to send you to university. Not at all. My, you my grand. education was paid for by Warwickshire. Precisely. Council. Now, what's going to happen in the future if um, children can't do that? You're not going to get... Well, what will happen is what happens in America. You have to take on loans and you spend the first ten years of your professional life paying off your debts uh, for your education. Do you That's what happens that? in America. No, I absolutely not. Mm. But I mean somebody has to pay for the education. Does it was it why should Warwickshire really have paid for my education? Why don't what you What does Warwickshire gain <laughs> out of me? Why don't you like your taxes going to help people? Absolutely. Who um, absolutely I do. Mm. Since I pay so much of them I Well there you are then. Oh, there you are then. Pay. pay your taxes and let <laughs> people go to university. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> What are you doing under there? I'm waiting for something cool, dark and sophisticated to come along. At Christmas, it's often those personal gifts that mean the most. The ones that say, I love you. Like the classic fragrances from Monterey. Style Parfum de Toilette. The elegant and romantic perfume. Tweed. The timeless classic and fashion perfume spray, a vibrant fragrance full of French flair. Classic gifts by Lanterie. We've got Christmas wrapped up. Classic Sleeping Beauty is available on video only this Christmas for the whole family to own and treasure forever. Give someone a video with some fun and games this Christmas. Like the witches of Eastwick. They have lots of fun playing tennis. Or having little party games. But goodness knows how they play Postman's Knock. Woolworths, we've got a gift for Christmas. There is a country in Europe where for 2,000 years they've produced one of the world's finest wines. A wine matured for at least three years in oak casks. A wine so special, it is found in only one tiny region of this country. The name of this region? Jerez, in Andalusia. The name of this country? Spain. And the name of this wine, Sherry. Well, this is my first time in Stratford. I didn't realise there were so many next and principles for Shakespeare to shop at. These were actually the real shops that Shakespeare shopped at. Dixon's, yes, uh -huh. Dixon's. Dorothy Perkins. He'd got most of his curtains from uh, Austin's here. His tights from the sock the, shop, isn't very, There you have it, you see. His right. hose, he'd call it, not uh -huh. tights. Oh, his sister was rather a comely lass it, as well, yes, wasn't she? Yes, yes, she's done very well for herself. Uh, mm. <laughs> Been around a bit, mind you. 
Shakespeare's chemist, this was. Shakespeare, what did yes. he buy there? Something he got most of his sh something of the week. I'll, I'll do the funny lines, okay? <laughs> you do the, you know what I mean. Do you get a sense of Shakespeare here? It's quite difficult, I think. Well, certainly in the, in the main part of the town. The only way you get a sense of Shakespeare is uh, on the stage. I mean, when you hear the, hear his, you know, his words. This, I mean, is just like a, a tourist trap. This could be anybody, you know. Well, I don't know. You get a sense of um, Robert Burns when you wander around the areas he came from. You can actually see what formed the man and see where his ideas came from. You're saying that Scottish things are better, then? No! It's done, it's done better, there. <laughs> no, I'm not, Eric! <laughs> I'm just saying! You get a sense of the man from where he yes, grew up. Yes, but this is so different. I mean, you know, uh, how do you get a sense of Shakespeare, then? I know, it's a sort of theme park he, England man, again, isn't it? He's a man that doesn't have a, a centre anyway. He's so, that's what's so phenomenal about his talent. He can write so much about so many different characters. You don't feel there's a man in there. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Well, you, I mean, you managed to straddle theatre, television and film. Straddle. <laughs> yes, I straddle. Do a lot of straddling. <laughs> and even opera. Yes. Um, where does your heart lie? It's just about here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I like to do things. I mean, I like things, you know, that are sort of odd or, or dangerous or a little bit different. Mm. I, like to, I like to do... I've done sort of one of nearly everything now. Um, it doesn't matter to me as long as it's sort of interesting to me. It's like things come up, like the opera just came up out of the blue. And it was like, seemed an interesting thing to do. Were well, you a bit nervous about that, never having yeah. sung clapping? Absolutely. Or... But then you find out that opera singers are just as scared of saying words, the dialogue, as you are of singing. You see. What's everybody staring at here? I have no idea. I think there's something going on. It's the Duke of Kent's barge. Oh, it's quite exciting, eh? <laughs> would you ever go a barging holiday? I would just never would. Uh, like barging into people on holidays. <laughs> a barge holiday. You always get these documentaries going, oh, wow, you know, the peace no, and quiet of the canal. As you wait in a traffic jam to go through a lock, <laughs> using the small L sand at the back the while. So can you sing brilliantly now? Let's yes, hear. I can. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, I'm always one to give faint but this is gorgeous. The real sort of. Don't look at me like that. I'm not bullshitting. And they it's have lovely. beautiful places in Scotland too, though, probably, don't they? <laughs> is this your sort of England? Is this where you feel most comfortable? No, I like it to be totally empty of people. But this is oh. quite. Uh, for, a, for a town, a major town, this is very pretty, I think. Yes. They're very rural. Very rural, and Shakespeare, when he was a boy or girl, used to come to this theatre and see the plays put on. <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to come here and used to get a boat and go up river in a little boat, and it very quickly becomes all like willows and no, nothing around, just little, like a little stream. And I used to think, oh, this was definitely the place of Wind in the Willows. And uh, at school, that was my first performance I ever gave, it was in Toad of Toad Hall and I played the part of second field mouse. And they offered me the part of first field mouse, but I found that second field mouse had more lions. So I took second field mouse. And um, I've always felt very close to Toad of Toad Hall. It's all been downhill since then, really, isn't it's, it? It's all been downhill, but one day it will do. I thought Python could have done Toad of Toad Hall. It'd be very good, you know. Well, you wouldn't want to corrupt that lovely story. Which story? Wind in the Willows and Toad of Toad. Oh, but I mean, John would have played Badger, you know, and Terry Jones is a natural Mr. Toad. <laughs> and Michael would play Molly, and I'm a natural ratty, really, you know what I mean? And Gilliam was the weasels, the ferrets, and the stoats. You are a natural ratty, Graham is, uh, <laughs> Graham's the washerwoman, obviously. <laughs> natural ratty. <laughs> Wander off. Right, I think we get a ferry over here. A ferry? No, a ferry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I haven't been on the back of a ferry in years going across the river. <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream. And a very quaint little ferry it is, too. It is. A mere 15 pence will take us 
into the heart of Shakespeare's land. 15p. 15p? Have you got 15p? No. Nope. Just as well we're allowed a large film crew with a PA that will probably a, provide yeah. it. They'll probably take American Express. <laughs> <laughs> this is Stratford. They'll probably take dollars, actually. <laughs> What kind of Very things good. do you admire in another human being, then? What attributes, what qualities? Ah, intellectual honesty. Uh, a nice bottom. <laughs> Generosity and a good laugh. What's intellectual honesty? Being honest uh, with themselves? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That's a sort of necessity, I think, for comedy. Does that mean that you're very self-critical? Yes. Do interviewers ever stop asking questions? Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You don't like being interviewed, do you? No. Why? Because it's vaguely ridiculous. It's vaguely silly. Look, here's a joke. <laughs> fanar, oh. fanar, <laughs> fanar. Sorry. <laughs> well, what's silly about it? People want to know who you are. They want to know... Well, I think, think the whole point of that, of getting dressed up and pretending to be other people, is you're essentially trying to hide. Which means that probably deep down you're kind of shy. And why should they know anyway? Because... I don't go to their houses prying into their questions about intellectual honesty and... <laughs> well, I mean, I understand your reticence to be interviewed, but at the same time, it's a form of vanity, refusing to justify yourself. I just feel that you should be very well prepared, especially with comedy. Um, so as not to bore them or be dull or... <laughs> I'll just bore them silly so that I like to have things rehearsed and be minutely planned and, and then you can go on and do it. Whereas you, it doesn't really matter in real life, you can try and be funny. Well, I mean, you know, that's, that's sort of implying that you think you're a boring person without a script. It's just patently not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, well... Yeah, but, it, I mean, often the chat show format is very, very restrictive and boring, and what you happens is, especially in, say, something like the old Wogan, you get pre-interviewed. Yeah. Some wee researcher comes around and asks you, he takes you to lunch, and you start a few boring anecdotes, and then they, you go on the Wogan show, and you find there's a big cue card behind your head with all the questions feeding into these anecdotes. <laughs> you know, and Terry sits there with a glazed look over your shoulder, desperately trying to feed you in for these, and if you have no memory like I do, really, <laughs> then you're, you're desperately trying to remember what you said at lunch four days ago to this researcher, <laughs> and he plied you with too much wine. Where is this now? Where are we? We're just past the, uh, the arse rubbing centre. <laughs> <laughs> Never miss a try. Make them laugh with willies or bottoms. <laughs> Was it a source of regret to you that you didn't grow up knowing your dad because he died when you were so young? Um, no, in many ways it's sort of easier because you don't have anybody to, you know, react against or have to reject or have to fight. But did you find it hard then, um, you've got a son now who's 16, <clears throat> did you find it hard dealing with him not having had an example um, well, from it, your own father? In fact, again, I think it was easier because I didn't have anybody to, to turn into. And to be like, no, don't you do that. And you, find, you know how people you find yourself doing things that your parents did. I, I, I didn't have, have that. I had no idea what the role model was. So I just, like, treated him like a, a mate. Does that <laughs> and, work? And uh, he, you know, he put me to bed <laughs> early, you know, and he'd stay up. <laughs> well, he seems to be a very nice guy. Yes. Well, I was going to ask you something really intelligent, and I've just forgotten what it was. <laughs> well, whilst we're waiting for Muriel to think up something intelligent to say, let me tell you a little about the Holy Trinity Church. It was built in some time in the 17th century, and it houses the grave of Shakespeare. You can come in now, Muriel, we're ready for your question. Here comes Muriel's final big question. We've only walked 15 miles. Oh, continue to on this side. Your son, does he ever suffer from being the son of a very famous father? Now, all the Python kids seem... They, they've all turned into rather excellent kids. I think it's kind of healthy having a parent who's a loony and dressed up and acts like an idiot. You can't say, you know, that... You, you can't be disappointed in them somehow. You mean <laughs> slightly embarrassed. Do the, do the Python team seem almost like family to you because you've known them for so long? Yes. 
Absolutely. I mean, it's a, sort of like family, I guess, and also like a an old team you played for, mm. being an old Liverpool side or something. I mean, I was just saying the other day that I met John Cleese in 1963, and I met Terry Jones at the end of that year, and Graham Chapman in that year. In 64, I met Palin. You know, this is an awful long time. It's a quarter of a century with these these people, and you get, you know, spent so much time with them, dressed up in silly costumes on location, that you know them quite well on one level, and yet on another level there, you don't know really anything about them at all. Are you ever frightened of unhappiness? Um, do you ever sort of think to the future and, and, and dread being unhappy? I think it's your own responsibility not to accept those choices that lead to unhappiness. You shouldn't rub the, the bad tooth that's going to give you pain. And that, you know, don't look for it. It's going to come soon enough. Mm. <laughs> you should look on the bright side, <laughs> right. I think. Always look on the bright side. Do you have any regrets then so far? Um, well, luckily, I've got no memory left, so um, <laughs> I've forgotten most of the things I'm supposed to regret. Have you had a horrible day? Do you hate me if you're asking me I have a very enjoyable day. You have um, not. You've just been moaning and not answering the questions. I have not been, been moaning and groaning. You have you walked so. me for since... Uh, what time is it now? It's 7, 6.30. We started at 9.30. It's a 23-minute programme. Well, you chose uh, the And we've been on the... For nine hours, we've been walking endlessly. <laughs> I didn't choose it. I We've didn't We've got shot 180 it. minutes of film, which you're going to edit down to 23 minutes. I hope Michael Gray can afford all this. What do you I want? I really do. Seven minutes in a chat show in a <laughs> studio asking you about your film. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> now. Oh, Lance Percival is so much easier. Yes, you'll love him. <laughs> he can do improv with you. He can do a calypso <laughs> together. Thank you, that will be all. <laughs> Don't do it in series, Michael. Spend it on comedy or something useful. And after a midwinter break, Walkie Talkie returns on Friday the 2nd of February at half past eight. Christmas Eve on Channel 4, and at 7, a glimpse into the life of the nation's favourite racehorse, Desert Orchid. At 8, we go heavy metal with the born-again Christian band Striper, who sing to hell with the devil. And at 9, there's a familiar face at a familiar time. It's just time for me to do some last-minute rapping before this week's edition of One Hour with Jonathan Watts. Music, comedy chat, and, of course, the odd chocolate bar. At 10, there's American football. That's followed at 11.30 by the moving story of Julia. I cannot say now that I had ever used the words gentle or strong, but I did think that night that it was the most beautiful face I had ever seen. There's something for everyone this Christmas Eve on 4. Some pleasant and some unpleasant surprises for the widower who is still working and attracting the attentions of the more mature ladies of Miami. That's Harry Weston in Empty Nest. Next. Meanwhile, on ITV, the final episode of Stay Lucky begins in a couple of minutes. Where is it, Paul? First door down the corridor. Paul? Paul? <coughs> Sorry, didn't realise. <laughs> Sorry. Find to tell his please, Bob. Where were you? Where was I? Where were you? What I told you. First room no, no. around the corner. I went down there. I opened the door. <laughs> and you <laughs> heard. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> Telly bitter. You've got to hand it to him. At Christmas, it's often those personal gifts that mean the most. The ones that say, I love you. Like the classic fragrances from Monterey. Style Parfum de Toilette. The elegant and romantic perfume. Tweed. The timeless classic. And Fashion Perfume Spray. A vibrant fragrance full of French flair. Classic gifts by Monterey. We've got Christmas wrapped up.
This will be a pushover. Even for you, Cohen. Iceberg alcohol-free wine for people who don't need to get merry in order to make merry. Hi, girls. Looking for someone warm and cuddly. Why, have you got a hamster in your pocket? <laughs> Iceberg. Alcohol-free wine. No, oh well, thanks very much anyway. Goodbye. Townsend. Hello. You know the Hornby Double O Model Railway? Yeah. Do you have an R186 signal box? Well, let's see. Yes, I got one left. Great! They've got one, Mum. Good old yellow pages. We're not just there for the nasty things in life, like a blocked drain or a broken window. We can help with the fun things, too. Dad. <laughs> After words, silence. After fire, ice. After time, peace. After dark, Tia Maria. on him. I don't want a TV crew coming in here, messing up my kitchen, setting up all that video equipment. Well, how about shooting it in your bedroom, Blanche? The equipment's already set up. Yeah. The Golden Girls, tonight at 10 on 4. And there's a formidable golden-haired girl for Harry Weston to deal with now in Empty Nest. <laughs>